Transfer portal is officially closed for the summer. The spring window officially closed for undergraduates on Tuesday and for graduates on Wednesday. Today is Thursday, the second day of May. And welcome to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm staff writer Cody Goodwin. I'm dealing with some allergies, but I'm glad you guys are here. I'm joined today once again by Mike Rodak and Alex Scarborough. And guys, the portal closing... And maybe this is because of your tweet, Mike. It feels a little bit like school letting out for the summer. I'm sure there's a massive exhale from college head coaches all across the country. Um, and there's likely a similar massive exhale from those of us in the media who cover college sports. Or maybe it just feels that way, given that Alabama specifically um, has experienced three different separate transfer portal windows this year. There was the original transfer portal window um, early December to mid-January. We had an automatic transfer window that we had to cover when Nick Saban retired for 30 days. And then there was this spring window the last two weeks, but it's officially closed now. We can all take a deep breath. We can all maybe get normal sleep schedules back in order. Um, you guys have kids, so I don't know about all that. But how do we feel initially about the fact that the portal is officially closed? Like, What are any sort of initial thoughts, big picture ideas? Mike, I'll throw it to you first. Well, it's, it's different. It's actually the first year that it's completely closed. I mean, because typically graduates could go in at any time and they kind of snuck in a rule change a couple of weeks ago when they made some other changes where the graduate portal is also now closed. Um, once the undergraduate portal closes, technically it was a day later this year. Honestly, I think it was just an administrative thing because uh, they said until May 1st instead of through April 30th. Um, and so there was an extra day, but really it's the same time that it's closing and, and it doesn't reopen to, according to my reading of the new rule until the academic year begins, which for Alabama would be like the second week of August. Uh, so you can say with, I would say a 99% degree of certainty that the portal is now closed for all Alabama football and men's basketball players until the middle of August. It will reopen for graduates at that point, And then it will reopen for undergraduate football players in early December. Uh, so you're really locking yourself in if, if you're one of those players. Um, now, is there like a weird loophole that a player can get out if the team kind of lets them out of their scholarship or whatever the case may be? I, I do think that's entirely possible. I think we saw it last year, Jamil Burrows, uh, when he went into the portal in the middle of June. So I wouldn't completely rule out um, that sort of situation, but I think we can fairly safely say that the roster that they have now isn't going to lose players between now and fall camp. Um, now, it's just a question of what they will gain. Because even though the portal is closed, the players that are in the portal have until whenever they want to go in and pick a new team. So there's still going to be activity over the next couple of weeks in terms of Alabama picking more players up. And, um, you know, we'll have to see how long that stretches into. But they still have a couple open spots. I think they're at 83 now. Um, and again, scholarship math can be a little bit fuzzy. Um, but, you know, there's a couple spots, I think, is is a fair way of putting it. And um, it will be a quiet summer in terms of not having coaches, not having to worry about losing a player to the portal and kind of having that open-ended nature of is some graduate player who's a fourth or fifth year guy on our team is all of a sudden in the middle of July going to say, I want a new team. I don't think you have to worry about that with the current rules. And we talked a little bit about this last time that players that, you know, they kind of had, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on, you know, undergrad or graduate to get their paperwork filed, um, you know, so we may see a name populate into the portal either later today or sometime Friday, um, you know, but we talked about that players that get into the portal now, like ideally they'll probably make their decision within the next couple of weeks. So then they'll move and they'll get adjusted and they'll get ready for, you know, summer workouts and fall camp and whatnot, but they do more or less have the rest of the summer to kind of figure out where they're going. Um, Alex, just the, with the portal closing, like, do you have anything to add on to that or any other initial thoughts on just kind of the way this window went? And, um, you know, we'll get to Alabama here in a minute, but just kind of big picture thoughts. Yeah, it was kind of meh. I mean, there was no Jordan Addison. There was no big name guy that you went, oh, my God, everybody's going to go clamor for. I know there's a TCU defensive tackle. Uh, we're still waiting. That's a, a high quality player. But the, the mass number of players uh, that you – really would have gotten a bidding war for was just not there. Uh, and so in a sense, it was a little bit of a letdown. You can argue whether we should have expected it or not. <clears throat> but overall, it just kind of came and went. And, you know, I don't think any teams necessarily got gutted. Uh, Michigan State really got hurt at the very end. 
losing a bunch of players, some of which might make sense for Alabama. We can talk about that. Um, but uh, overall, just kind of came and went, and, and we're on the other side of it now. And uh, like I said, it's not just coaches taking a, a sigh of relief. It's us, too, not having to watch everything every second of the day, wondering what shoe might drop. We kind of have a pretty good picture of what the roster is going to look like, give or take a couple positions. Uh, if they can add guys, but they're not uh, going to lose any necessarily. Yeah, the uh, the Matt Zenits and the Chris Hummers of the world can finally, um, you know, get some sleep, right? So they don't have to check the portal over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> let's start with football. With regards to the transfer portal, Alabama lost four scholarship players. Quick recap, Curtis Perry off the defensive line, James Brockermeyer off the offensive line, Peyton Woodyard. Um, one of the star freshmen out of the defensive backfield, and then Tony Mitchell out of the defensive backfield. We can also throw in Upton Belafont, who was a walk-on kicker, kind of in the middle of that kicker battle through the spring months, um, but he's one of a you know dozen walk-ons or so. Alabama also picked up three players through the portal. Caden Proctor, offensive tackle, returned after spending you know a day or two at Iowa, I suppose. Cam Howard, defensive back from Charlotte, and then Graham Nicholson, a kicker from Miami of Ohio, the Lou Groza winner. Um, Mike, I'll throw it back to you. What, what does it say? Let's start here first. What does it say that Alabama really only lost four players off this roster? I know we talked a little bit about how there's really you can't do the intra-conference transfer thing um, during this spring window. So a lot of players that maybe wanted to stay in the SEC couldn't. So maybe they just thought about wanting to stay here. But only losing four players, um, that seems like it's a pretty good thing, right? And maybe a good um, reflection on what this staff was able to do. Or, or what do you think about the, the departures? Yeah, you know, I think oh, I did a radio interview at the very beginning of the portal window and asked me how many players I thought would go in. I said between three and eight, which is kind of a wide range, but I guess I can pat myself on the back and say that I was within that sort of, uh, you know, big, big number I, I set for myself. And I think that's, it seems on par with expectations, like have four players leave. I think, you know, maybe there's a couple guys that, you kind of look on the depth chart and say, does it make sense for that player to stay? I think obviously quarterback was probably the biggest place we were looking through the spring to see what would happen with Ty Simpson and Dylan Lonergan in particular. And both of those guys decided to stay. Um, now, will they still be here after the December portal window? We'll have to see. Um, but I think to them, at least it made sense that they can stay and hang around and, you know, be part of a, uh, an offensive mind that's been, you know, proven to, to develop a quarterback, which we saw with Michael Penix and, you know, Ty's case, maybe compete for the starting job at some point. We'll have to see. Um, so that was really the one position where I could say, like, maybe I was a little bit surprised not to see anybody go in. I, I thought they would lose a defensive lineman just out of pure numbers. I think they were heavy at that spot and they did in Curtis Perry. Um, you know, I think James Brockemeyer, was a name that we kind of had heard of, as a potential portal guy in the spring. And he, he went in, um, you know, Tony Mitchell certainly was on the radar going into that, that window that just closed. And I think maybe the one name that was a little bit surprising was Peyton Woodyard, like out of those four. So, um, you know, they're at a deficit right now in the secondary, which is actually interesting because, you know, that was already a, a need in, in terms of numbers. So they're still, um, you know, they're looking at more corners. Like I would expect them to have at least one or two defensive backs coming in at some point. But in terms of the guys leaving, like we said, you know, there wasn't an SEC possibility. Um, I think a lot of these guys seem to have bought into the, um, you know, the Kalen DeBoer coaching staff and the Kalen DeBoer program and just kind of want to see where things go in, in August. And there's there's starting spots available. Um, you know, probably a wide receiver. I think there's there's definitely playing time available. I think along the offensive line, there's there's probably some playing time available at tackle. Um, and there's guys who just think that this is the best place for them, which is perfectly fine. Like we all talk about you want to leave, like you, you should go somewhere else and get money. Like sometimes it's okay just to be where you are, like and kind of do the old school route, like Ty Simpson's doing. Um, and so they have some players that probably turn down money you know, bigger money from, from other places to stay at Alabama. And yes, I, I do think that that says something. Um, and we'll just have to see where it goes from here. Yeah. And <clears throat> you make a good point about operating from a deficit, Alex, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this, the defensive backs, like that was already a position of need that Alabama was going to seek going into this portal window. Uh, Caitlin DeVore was very upfront about that. So you lose two guys who, you know, Peyton Woodyard ran with twos during the spring. Tony Mitchell, you know, even further down on the depth chart a little bit. But, like, you lose depth like that, 
not ideal, especially when it's exciting depth. Um, young guy like Peyton Woodyard had, you know, pretty good spring, you know, final scrimmage there. At least I thought he had a couple of nice moments, even though he was running with the twos. Um, and then James Brockermeyer, like not just, you know, losing potentially, you know, you know, a guy that could start at center for you, but you know, a guy who has been in the system, he knows the, you know, I, I would think he could be an interior swing type guy. Like that's, you know, cause when you look at Alabama starting offensive line, right, we're assuming Brailsford's going to be there at center. Booker and Roberts could potentially be the best guard duo in the SEC, if not the country. But behind them, I think Mike made this point earlier, not a lot of experience behind them. So when you lose a guy like Brockermeyer, you lose a guy who could potentially step in if either of those guys go down for whatever reason. Do you worry about the depth that maybe takes a hit here? Or what's maybe some of your early thoughts on some of the departures from the program this spring window? Yeah, I think to start off, it was a good reflection on Kalen DeBoer and the staff. that It was not a wholesale uh, departure and it did meet the expectation of what they thought was going to happen, which I think is as important as what we thought on the outside is that they have a pulse of the team because it talked to people and they said, yeah, we'll lose a few, a couple. So four is pretty much on track with that. There's probably one or two in there, whether it's Pey Brockermeyer or Peyton Woodyard, who you wonder, was there a fight to keep them and they just couldn't do it. But overall, not the mass numbers leaving. I think it probably says a good thing about what's left in terms of the defensive backs and those freshmen and whether or not they're ready to play. Because ultimately, if you have the if you have the ability to play football at Alabama, you're probably going to stay. If you think I got to fight for reps and it's not going to be there, you do want to find a new home. And, and in the case of Brockerbier, probably says a good thing about Parker Brailsford and his readiness to come back and be a contributor. But yeah, the depth is part of the, the concern on both of those fronts, right? Because, I mean, Caleb DeVore talked about it a few weeks ago. It's not just what you're going to see on Saturday and what happens if there's an injury or two or three. A lot of times you can deal with those by moving players around and plugging holes as best you can. It's about practice. It's about the ability to practice ones versus twos and threes versus fours constantly. That's how you develop players is through reps. And if you don't have enough players, it makes practice hard at certain positions. So that's why I think you're going to have to see them get a little bit aggressive in terms of the players who are left in the portal to try to meet those needs in terms of numbers. Um, but it's a concern. I just don't think it's, you know, flashing red light worry. I just think it could be a behind the scenes thing where they just got issues on their hands certain certain days of practice where they can't, they don't have the numbers to do things they want to. They don't get that solved. Talking about practice, hmm. practice. Matters. Alabama pick. We picked up three players: um, Caden Proctor, Cam Howard, Graham Nicholson. We talked about that, um, <clears throat> but we know that coming into this portal window, they were seeking specifically offensive tackle. Um, Caden Proctor solves one half of that equation. I think that's still a position maybe they're going to seek out a little bit. Cam Howard, defensive back, adds some depth there, even after losing two guys. Um, you know, not just depth, but experience. Right? He played a lot as a freshman last year for the 49ers. Um, still probably looking for a little bit more experience there. Nicholson, I think, you know, you, you don't go get the Lou Groza award winning kicker if he's not going to come in and be the guy. Um, we're assuming that they're still looking for, you know, another offensive tackle, another defensive back. Um, are there, you know, are there other positions that maybe they should take a look at? We've talked about depth at certain positions, like, you know, touching on the interior of the offensive line, maybe, you know, a linebacker, interior linebacker with some experience there as well. Are, are there are there other positions that maybe come to mind? Mike, I'll throw it back to you that, you know, that they should be looking for now that the portal window is officially closed and they know who's in there. Well, again, it comes down to like, how do you make the scholarship math work? Again, there's, there's yeah. probably some leeway there, gray shirts or however they want to do it um, to make it work. But I don't know if you can be like, oh, let's go get an inside linebacker, a wide receiver, an offensive line, and two corners right now. Like, that's probably too long of a shopping list. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, you make a good point about inside linebacker. I kind of forgot about Cleo Jacobs, uh, the South Alabama player from, you know, Kane Womack that he already knows and is familiar with and tried to go get in January and went back to South Alabama for the spring. Um, you know, my thought when I saw that was it's probably not an immediate area of need, but maybe they thought they were going to lose Jeremiah Alexander or Justin Jefferson and needed an experienced backup because they have four freshmen coming in at that spot. Um, but again, it's one of those things where if you bring them in, it's not like that other player can just leave right now because the portal is not open. Can you make them leave again? Is there some mechanism 
administratively to to get a guy out um probably but i again i don't know i'm not an expert in some of that stuff it's some of that's academic and uh, Deion sanders would know right right <laughs> yeah i mean there's there, i think there is a way to release a player from their scholarship or whatever it is over the summer um but that just seems messy so i think right now if you're focused on your biggest needs and not the luxuries it has to be corner just from, again from a pure numbers standpoint um, you know, they need corners. So that would be the number one thing, but kind of go down the list. I think offensive, honestly, interior offensive line, I see as a bigger need right now for depth than I do tackle because right now they're completely inexperienced beyond the projected three starters. Um, and then I, again, I think wide receiver would have been a nice luxury. Um, if you could have found the right player and it worked out, uh, because that could be an area of sneaky deficiency this year. Um, but it hasn't worked out, and I don't think I don't think you would prioritize bringing in a wide receiver right now over a corner. If well, you and one work, then sure. Yeah, and one thing to remember: um, five-star receiver from Fairland, Ryan Williams. He will be joining the program here within the next what couple weeks or so, whenever he's officially done with his high school stuff. So, but again, <clears throat> you talk about working at maybe a little bit of a deficit. We're not sure exactly, you know, he wasn't there during spring ball. You know, I'm sure that there was constant communication there and he's probably had his nose in the playbook and, um, you know, Jamarcus Shepard and Kalen DeBoer and even Nick Sheridan, very excited about his addition, but true freshman still coming in, didn't get to practice. Like you just, you wonder where he'll be day one of fall camp. How much will he be able to contribute right away? Like that's just, it's a little bit of a question mark. So going to find an experienced receiver who at least can fill that role while he maybe gets up to speed a little bit, best case scenario. Um, that's a good point. That's a good point. The thing is they have that guy though, don't they? With Kobe Prentice and Kendrick Law, you've got guys who might not set the world on fire, but you know what you're going to get from them and you have the, the experience that's already there. So, you know, those guys can be your lead with Jeremy Bernard also in that mix, where a Caleb Odom, also another guy who you wonder how quickly can he get on the field, the pressure isn't there immediately for them to be there because they do have those three guys at the top. So Yes, would it would it have been great to go get you know again a Jordan Addison or somebody like that? That guy didn't come available, um, and I don't. I want to give credit, but I don't remember who put this out there. It might have been our guy Chris Hummer or somebody else. But the the lack of star power in the portal versus the needs of certain teams created a market that I think would where you were going to overspend to get a guy who was a starter caliber player, and is that worth doing? If you're in Alabama and you've got the the idea of roster retention being as or more important, uh, if you're talking about spending and it's not unlimited resources and we know it's not, I think you can be interpreted in some of those receivers or luxury positions that they didn't want to overspend to get a guy. Yeah, and I, I think it speaks to the entire roster, too, because you have those three guys at the top, Bernard, Law, and Prentice, and then after that, everybody's inexperienced, which is kind of how things go right now in college football, where you have the guys that are the projected starters. They're going to stay, especially at a program like Alabama. And then you have your freshmen coming in who aren't in most cases going to leave yet. We've seen a few of them between Jameer Grimsley, Julian Say, and Peyton Woodyard do that. But most of them are going to be like, all right, let's give it a year before I, I, I'm really getting upset about playing time. But that middle of the roster for guys who have been around for a year or two and haven't really played yet, those are the guys you lose through the portal nine times out of 10. Uh, so that middle of that roster has gotten gutted and, and wide receivers right in that mix. Um, so again, you have Bernard Prentice law who all of playing time you had Hale. doesn't seem like he's going to be back this year. And then after that, Cole Adams, you didn't really play last year. Odom who's a freshman, Bubba Hamilton, Hamilton who's a, a freshman, Jaron Hamilton, who didn't really play last year, Emmanuel Henderson, who hasn't really played his first couple years. And then you have the three freshmen coming in this summer, Jefferson, Rico Scott, and Ryan Williams. So there's a huge kind of gap there um, between the top three and, and what's beyond them in terms of experience, but not really in terms of talent because the talent behind the top three is is pretty good. Um, so it's just a matter of, of, like we've said, how fast Ryan Williams can come along, how fast Caleb Odom can come along. And um, if they are kind of as advertised early on, then – I think you have your number four, number five guys and just see how things go from there where, you know, Ryan Williams could easily become your number two guy by the end of the year.
and I wrote this in the, the summer preview for the receivers, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. If there's any position on this entire roster that I think you can say they get the benefit of the doubt because of the coaching staff and their track record, mm-hmm. I think it's receiver. I think you just had a guy go in the first round, the second round, and the third round from Washington. And those are all guys that they that I think two years ago we would have said, who were they? So I think Jamarcus Shepard, Kalen DeBoer, Nick Sheridan, those guys, you have to say, look, is it the ideal group on paper? Maybe not, but they've shown that they can develop guys at that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure that that was an easy, um, you know, the, the phrase that comes to mind is like recruiting tool, but like, you know, I'm sure as they were having some of these conversations after spring ball and some of these guys are thinking about, you know, what's my future look like? Um, Jamarcus Shepard's probably sitting back in his chair pointing at the NFL draft board saying, hey, we had three top 100 guys. Like, if you stay here and you commit to it, good things can happen. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that's exactly how it went, but I'd like to picture it in my head that those guys are sitting in their office and Shepard's just like, yo, look at what we can do if you stick around. Um, we've obviously been next with a screenshot and just don't say anything, but yeah, <laughs> however you want to visualize it. Hey, guys. Um, you know, maybe it did go that way. I don't know. He seems like a, a, a character. So perhaps it was that animated. Um, because of Alabama's needs, we've obviously all been paying, um, you know, varying levels of attention to the players that have gone into the portal. Um, so when you look at, you know, some of Alabama's needs or some of the positions that we think they should be targeting, um, you mentioned a guy like Khalil Jacobs. So I, th- I think it's kind of slowed down a little bit on that front. But you look at some of these players at defensive back, specifically corner, um, you know, some offensive tackles, a little bit of the interior offensive line as well. Some of the names that are in the portal. Um, do any of them that at least that we've been paying attention to maybe jump out as, you know, fits um, potentially to come and join Alabama? Uh, Mike, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I mean, and Jacobs is still set to visit um, on this Saturday. And um I believe it was on three reported first about uh, Deshaun Jones, the, um, Wake. the Wake Forest corner, and then also the uh, the Houston corner, which is so many Isaiah names. Hamilton. Isaiah Hamilton. You know, I'll say just as a quick aside, when I covered the NFL, you kind of had like your, your names to remember. When you cover college sports and you have the portal and you have basketball and you have football and you have high school recruiting – there's just tens of thousands of names in my head and I can't remember half of these guys. I don't know how <laughs> some of these people do it who cover recruiting full time. It's like, man, there's so many names. Um, but yes, those two Houston and in, in the Wake Forest corners, um, I think are again, corner has to be the priority right now from pure numbers. Um, you know, I, the, the two Michigan state guys going into the portal, I think are both experienced. I think they obviously would have a good relationship with um, Chris Kapelovic uh Gino Vandemark and, and Ethan Boyd uh Boyd being a tackle Vandemark being more of an inside guy would they want to come to Alabama especially maybe in Vandermark's case knowing they probably want to start you know I don't know their specifics yet um on those two guys but you know I think Brett Greenberg did a good job of kind of laying out some of the the top names that are left and um yeah I, I don't think like that there's still some big fish out there, if you will, in terms of like Cormani McLean. And then there's the um, the USC offensive lineman who's probably going back to Florida. But that's not that, – that never really seemed to be the case with Alabama in terms of the players that they're going after. Um, and, again, the Charlotte safety and then these Houston and, and Wake Forest corners seem to be more of their wheelhouse in, in terms of what realistically is going to happen for them. Yeah. Alex, anything to add to that? Yeah, and the fact that they were going after Ed Woods, who ultimately ended up transferring to Michigan State, I think does show that they they clearly want to add a defensive back. They were very optimistic that that was going to happen. It changed. Things happen. Um, But uh, I think they need to target at least one DB. Because as Kalen DeBoer said, look, it's not just practice. It's special teams as well. And those guys tend to play a lot on special teams. So you need uh, the numbers there. So DB, offensive line. Um, I think those are the two ones and probably not a guy. And maybe this is, you know, I go back to what Kalen said early on in the portal and the idea of getting a guy and not having that then cause the domino effect of multiple guys leaving. Now the portal is already closed, so guys can't leave. But I don't think, I think they're going for depth more than they're going for a guy who would be a starter and therefore cause maybe a ripple effect through through the rest of the, the roster. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, I think that was kind of it on football. Um, Looking at basketball, because they also closed their portal this week. Not a ton of changes from the last time that we talked. Um, 
you know, I think some of the guys at Alabama lost six total players to the portal. Um, you know, Nick Pringle found a home at South Carolina. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, the six players that they lost, Pringle, uh, Rylan Griffin, Sam Walters, Davin Cosby Jr., Mo Wage, and Chris Parker. Um, I think everybody but Wage and Parker has found their new homes. But they did gain three, right? Aiden Holloway, Chris Youngblood, Houston Millette also flipped um, LeBaron Fallone. Is that how we pronounce his last Island. name? Island. Island. Okay, mm -hmm. so flipped him from Kansas. I say flip. He let out of his um, mm -hmm. national letter of intent, NLI, not NIL. Um, also, we're able to, there's some news drop, Grant Nelson officially coming back. Um, so the pieces of next year's Alabama basketball program more or less coming together. Um, Cliff Amore from, or Amore from Rutgers, um, big man, he took a visit this past week. Um, seems like Kentucky Center, um, I'm going to have to read this carefully, Ugana Onyenso. Um <laughs> Well, Both those guys are from Nigeria. It's kind of, um, which is kind of fun. That'd be, you know, nice international flavor if either one of them or possibly both of them end up here at Alabama. Um, both of those guys have been kind of the big men that Alabama seems to have zeroed in on. Um, you got to think landing one of them plus luring Mark Sears back from, you know, potentially going into the NBA draft would kind of solidify um, a very, very, very good roster for next year. Do we have any thoughts, uh, Michael? Start with you on the men's basketball portal movement slash visits slash just the way that the roster is coming together for next season. I would still be surprised if both go to Alabama. Um, just a, I don't know if it makes sense for both to come to Alabama for them, and B for Alabama, they don't have the scholarship space. They have twelve um, if you're counting Sears. So you kind of have to keep it open for Sears, unless you say to him don't come back, which obviously you're not going to do. He's a all American. So you kind of have to keep that scholarship open for a few more weeks. Um, unless there's some other weird departure, like Jaron Stevenson went into the draft. I don't think he's going to stay in the draft. The portal window is closed for him now. Um, I, the only other like hypothetical possibility would be a freshman getting out of his letter of intent early one of your three freshmen, but there's really, I think it's hard to make the math work for both of those big men to come in. So I think you're you're waiting on Cliff Amore first. He's the more experienced player. He's certainly the better offensive player. Um, he's visiting North Carolina today. We'll see what happens with that. If you don't get him, then I think the the Kentucky center um, Ugana and Woso is is certainly um, your option. Um, and he's you know he's more of a pure defensive center. Like offensively, he's not going to put numbers up for you. Um, probably in a mold of Charles Bediaco, um, but we'll have to see how that would work kind of with the other pieces they have around. Because I think the big question right now is how in the world do you make it happen with six guards? Uh, <laughs> if you have Mark Sears coming back and you have Sears, you have Phylon, you have Holloway, you have Millette, you have Youngblood, and you have um, – I've told you I'm bad with names. <laughs> 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 mention Holloway. Uh, I did yeah. mention Holloway. Uh, oh, Latrell, Latrell right so. Uh, so you have six guys that either they're transfers coming in who kind of by definition expect playing time, especially the experienced ones. Phylon's a very highly rated freshman who probably expects playing time. Otherwise, he probably would have gone somewhere else. And then you have guys that are returning, like Trelly and potentially Sears, that are already like there's proven playing time there. So what in the world do you do? Uh, it, it's a it's a first world problem for Alabama. Like it's it's a good problem to have. It's better than having too few guards. But um, you know, it, I think it's very hard to give six guards that much playing time. Um, you know, Nate Oates always says like defense will determine who plays, and I think that would be the ultimate example of that because you would have three other guys you can turn to on the bench if if Sears isn't playing defense or Trelly is not playing defense or whoever you can turn to the bench and there's some pretty good players that will be waiting there, you know, to put on the court. So um, that would be a, a, I'd say an ideal scenario for Nate Oates, but also, you know, probably a tricky one to navigate. Um, you know, there would need to be a lot of Mudita as, as they like to say last year that I think would have to exist on that bench. Um, you know, I, I don't know if any of them could really play the four, which is kind of something they were able to do last year mm -hmm. with Ryland because Ryland was six, six. You could play them at the four a little bit. Um, you know, they were probably giving up too much size against SEC teams. They were having some trouble rebounding when they did that. Um, I don't know if you can stretch any of these guys to the four. Millette's 6'5". Like, I don't think that's really 
you kind of want him on the outside shooting. So you're going to have Nelson or Jaron at the four, and then you're going to have potentially your shot blocker or Aiden Sherrill coming in playing five. Uh, or you have Stevenson and Nelson playing four and five together. And then you have six guards to play three spots. Or if Sears stays in the draft, you have five to play three, which is, you know, I think a more manageable situation. But again, good problem to have, but it's going to be really interesting to see. Like you told me, like, which three are going to play the most right now. Sears would be certainly in that group. But the other two picks, I'm like, good luck trying to figure that out. I think. You know, they're all really good players um, or at least have a lot of potential. Like Holloway and Phylon are both very highly rated young players that, you know, again, probably expect to be on the court and probably should be on the court. Yeah. I almost wonder if they land Cliff, for example. Let's play this out. You have Cliff at the five, Nelson at the four with Jaronson probably spelling him from time to time. Then you've got, you know, I don't want to say you play a three guard lineup, but that might be the best way to try and figure out, you know, how to get your best five on the floors. You know, you just kind of stick those two there and, figure out the rest of it um alex you got any thoughts or yeah what just wrap up real quickly like yeah i don't think you have like a wing that really plays in this offense with the way they've they've lined it up like they kind of had that wing last year in um in ryland yeah who's a little bit longer sam walter certainly played a lot of three last year i don't think they're really going to have that um i think there's kind of those tweener players whether it's darion reed nas cunningham um obviously mo d but those are going to be very limited minutes guys with the way that this is structured again i think you're going to have three smaller guards out there you're gonna have two big men and um that's just how you're gonna have to do it yeah well and you know knowing how Oates likes to play like there will be opportunity i think for them to kind of try and get a smaller lineup like knowing what nelson was able to do this past season right like he doesn't have to be the five all the time but like if they want to go smaller they can push him to the five and try and to but you know, like at four but yeah it just still doesn't solve the problem of what do you do with Philo, <laughs> Holloway, Youngblood, Millette, Sears, and Trelly. Because, uh, again, I don't think any of those six players can really play the four. That would be uh... – When I'm thinking – I'm hearing all this, and you know what I'm thinking about is when when Greg gave Nate the new contract, part of that was a commitment to spend an NIL. I think they've spent an NIL in terms of we're going to create redundancies in our guards because – there is the unknown with Phylon being a freshman. There is the unknown of Holloway and whether he gets his shot back. Because if he doesn't, he's got major problems getting on the basketball court. Yep. So could it create – if everybody pans out, there's not enough shots to go around. But who's pro- I mean, is that really a problem? I don't think so. I think you spend and you create those redundancies to say, hey, if one guy doesn't work out, I've got two more who can come off the bench. That's yep. a good point. And there's been times – you know, last year, late last year, when Ryland was hurt, when Trelly had the concussion issues, that they were probably thin on guards, um, and they had Davin Cosby playing probably more than he, you know, should have or needed to at that point. Um, obviously, the year before or two years before, they were definitely short on guards with J.D. Davidson and then Shaq and Quinterly being their only guys, and that was one of the years where Nate would say, "If I'm trying to get my guys to play defense, and that's all we have, and we need to play those guys, then." whether they're playing defense or not, I need to keep them on the court and there's nobody to turn to on the bench. Uh, this is the opposite of that. And this is a dream for Nate Oates in terms of trying to enforce his um, defense is his most important philosophy. Wanted to play this scenario out in my head, um, but instead I'll play it out on the pod. Let's assume that Mark Sears decides to stay in the NBA draft. What would kind of be the first order of business for Oates and the gang in terms of trying to fill maybe not his role, but just like how to polish off the roster if he decides to, you know, if he gets good feedback. I don't think they would fill that last spot. They didn't last year, you know, to fill the 13 scholarship spot. I think it would have to be if they did somebody who really would come in knowing they probably want to play. Um, Again, unless you, and I I don't know if this is realistic at this point, you're not going to bring in Cliff and Udana in late May. Like they're not going to wait around that long. Um, which is when you're going to find out about Sears. So it would have to be someone who's a veteran from a smaller school who just wants to go to Alabama. It's almost like a, a preferred walk-on who's paid. I, I, like, I don't even know how to put it. But it would, if, if they do fill that 13 spot, it would just be like some random point guard, I think, that would come in and just kind of be around. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that they would. I think in terms of a scholarship spot, in terms of like filling what Sears did for you last year, yeah, that, that raises a good question because I think there's a ton of optimism, a ton of 
good feelings around this team. I think there's a lot of that early. Some of that is based on the idea that Sears would come back. But if he doesn't, then you are talking about losing an All-American from a team, which for any team is going to be a challenge to replace. Um, and so I don't know if there's one player in the roster that just becomes Mark Sears. I think Latrell Wrightsell can continue to play a bigger role and be a really good player in his fifth year. Again, I think if Holloway finds a shot, he has that talent. If Phylon comes in right away and is everything as advertised as a freshman, he can play some minutes for you. I think realistically, scoring-wise, points per game-wise, I think Houston Millett probably has the best shot to replace a lot of that Sears production just because he's an experienced player coming in who can really shoot the three. You know, Chris Youngblood is too. Um, but I think Millett probably will handle the ball a little bit more. Um, Young Blood's a little bit thicker. I think he plays a little bit more of the wing spot. Um, but I think Millett would come in and be that veteran leader, that veteran presence that Sears has been for them the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, Alex, any any thoughts on the the way that the Alabama men's basketball roster is coming together, or do you have a favorite Clifford meme that Preston Murphy has been tweeting out lately? I try to stay off uh, Twitter and not try to interpret every meme because that would take all day. But uh, I just think to bring it back to the Sears thing <laughs> and, and, and what they do if he does come back, I mean, to, to make the conversation a full loop, the, the transfer portal is not where they're I don't think they're going to find the solution. The music has stopped. Everybody's finding their chair right now, and we won't know Sears for a while. I don't think there's going to be a guy out there who they say, oh, this is a guy we can bring in and be a starter. I think it's just finding the the right mix that works. Um, it sure would be nice to get him back, though, with the with the, the way he can handle the rock and the way he can really – the offense can flow through him. Um, but they're in, as we've said, they're in a really good spot in terms of numbers at guard. But, yeah, I don't think it's a transfer portal – solution at that point yeah no and it's you know if the, if the roster comes together in a way that you know they believe it will which is to say you know if they get cliff right then they can kind of take that back to sears plus an nil package i would assume that they're putting together right now and say look you can go to the nba or you can come back here and try and contend for a national championship and we'll pay you a little bit of money and then you can go off to the nba right so that's you know and i think you'd have to play to sears kind of hometown home state let's finish the job from what we didn't do last year. Um, let's get a ring. Like, I think you'd probably have to play more to that than let's come back and get you your draft stock improved for the NBA because Mark Sears' draft stock is always going to have a ceiling because of his height. He's not going to get any taller. That just is what it is. Like it, he comes back for another year. He's still going to be five eleven and three quarters at the combine next year. So, um, that's that's a limiting factor. And everybody saw what he can do offensively. It's like, there's no NBA scouts that are questioning that. I mean, maybe you could say play defense at a higher level all of next year. Would that help? Yes. But there's still a ceiling on what he would be. Um, I don't think he's a first-round pick. I think it's just solidifying yourself as a second-round pick that has a little bit better guaranteed money, a little bit better of a roster situation. Um, but I think the pitch to Sears and trying to – keep him is probably more sentimental, emotional um, in terms of what this means to him in Alabama and growing up here and all of that. I think um, there's probably more to gain on that end than there is coming back and trying to gain a lot through the draft, which I, I just don't know is there. Yeah, I think you can nibble on the edges in terms of the defense part, in terms of the, hey, maybe do you want to try your hand at playing a little bit of point guard uh, and being and showing that you have that position versatility? A little bit more, but no, it's going to be an emotional play, and I think it'll be a checkbook play too, right? Yeah, if you're a second round pick. What's what's the money you're getting there versus what Alabama can offer in terms of NIL, um, both in their collective and outside of that, in terms of brand, because of what he's been able to build through that run last season all the way through the Final Four. Uh, I think there's a lot there in terms of the financial piece of it as well. Yeah. All good points. All good points. Um, I think that's everything that we had that I wanted to touch on today. We'll be back probably sometime next week. Uh, I want to get Brett back on the horn and talk a little bit of recruiting since we've kind of put that to the side with all the transfer portal stuff that's been going on the last couple weeks. So um, we'll talk recruiting sometime next week. In the meantime, though, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. As always, we appreciate you guys for listening. Mike and Alex, appreciate you guys jumping on with me, and we will talk to you all again soon.